much. Like Derek said, thank you for taking the time to join. We know that as event season is approaching, that is very busy for you all. So we appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, tonight we'll be talking about preparing for transition, knowing that in the next six to seven weeks, a lot of the bulk of our dance marathon events happen. So we want to make sure that you guys can be equipped going into the season to make the best possible transition after your event. Um, knowing that after the event, we all are a little burnt out and it might not be the best time to prepare for transitions. Um, so today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> establishing strong transition habits early, really when you guys should start preparing for things. Like I said, after the event is not the most ideal time to start preparing. So when we should get that process rolling, um, we'll give you guys an example transition timeline of something that we find to be a best practice about when things should occur after the event, but also when things should occur um, leading up to the event. And then we will provide you lots and lots of transition material examples so that you guys can see how other programs around the country have um, handled their transitions in the past. Uh, when you guys leave from this webinar, we wanna make sure that you guys feel that you can prepare to more efficiently transition your teams. Uh, I know that a lot of the programs that I work with, they say, um, you know, in the middle of the year, towards the end of the year, oh, if we had only thought about this earlier, oh, I can't believe that got lost in the shuffle of transition. So we want to prepare you guys to minimize those, um, oh, darn it moments, or oh, we forgot about that moment. Um, and then we also want to make sure that you guys can make the best effective, most effective materials for transitioning. Um, we know that a lot of information throughout the year just lives in people's heads. So how can we put that into paper in a way that will make next year and the year after that and the year after that uh, teams have a little bit easier of a time. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that you guys have some sort of an idea of how timely these transitions should be. We wanna make sure that we give you an example timeline that you guys can follow pretty closely after your event so that we are prepared um, right away. And so some of you might be thinking, why are we talking about transitions? We know how to do this. And then you fall out of your chairs because you realize maybe you don't. Um, or maybe you are a program that does thorough transitions. But what Becca and I hope you all can get out of today's webinar is uh, at, at whatever level of transitions you and your team are at, um, elevating it to that next level and being able to have the incoming team feel even more prepared about the year and the journey they're about to embark on. So thorough and thoughtful transitions can dramatically improve the quality of work you do, reduce mid-year turnover, and increase the overall production of your team. I think that holds true, and I think that's sort of the co cornerstone of why we really wanted to dive in on transitions in January, right at the beginning of the semester uh, for all of you. So we're going to kick it off to a poll really quick. Um, and we want to hear from you. When do you start preparing for transitions? Uh, you'll see a text uh, a pop up may have shown up on your window if you're on the webinar. Um, hopefully you can see some version of that if you're tuning in on YouTube. We'll share the results here in just a minute. Uh, but I want to give folks an opportunity to get their vote submit. Seem coming in fast. All right, just another minute or so here. It's a super easy poll, so it shouldn't take too much time. Um, we'll go to 45 seconds. So three, two, one, and let's share out these results. So um, those of you who can see these results, uh, one, a person on the call, so 13% of folks um, have spend more than six months during, for their transition process. A good majority of folks on this call today are spending four to six months during the transition process, which is great. Um, a handful of folks are two to three months and then some fall in that one month or less than one month category. Our hope is regardless of when you're starting your transitions, um, as Becca said, one, starting them a little bit earlier, but also making sure they're thorough and robust throughout the year. So thank you all for participating. Great information um, to just kind of kick off this webinar. And I'm gonna kick it back to Becca to talk about uh, preparing for transitions. 
Yeah, absolutely. I can honestly say that I might be a little bit surprised that anybody starts preparing six months before transitions, but I'm so happy to hear it. Um, like Derek said, the majority of you guys fell between four to six months before your event is when you started preparing for transition. And I think that that is great. I think that we could even begin earlier than that. I think that transition prep can and should begin the minute you guys get that new exec board. So if you're in a leadership position, you know, you're on a presidential or steering committee, that it is really falls upon you guys to start prepping for transition at the very beginning of the year. So we have some things that can be set up right away that will help you guys throughout the year and help prepare people throughout the year as well to be mindful that they are recording the right information, keeping things stored in a place that makes sense, keeping things organized and making their work post event a little bit easier so that they don't have to rush to get everything to the new team. So this might seem intuitive to some people, to some others it may not. So set up some sort of information sharing system. Um, I know that a lot of programs will use Google Drive, us at CMN Hospitals use uh, Dropbox. If you are a school that has the office suite, you can use um, you know, Office 365, like OneNote or anything like that, OneDrive. Um, so this is just really important to make sure that information is organized in a way that makes sense and that's easy to find. So, you know, if we just use our school emails and we just change users year after year after year, things might not get saved, things might, might not get recorded over, you can't go back in that email history. So making sure that there is some central hub for your program where all team members can dump their contact sheets, their important documents, their planning documents, their brainstorming, anything like that. Um, like I said, you can also archive email communication. So your sponsorships chair can look back three or four years at the correspondence with certain partners, um, which is very, very helpful. Um, if you guys are not utilizing some sort of transition manual, don't worry, we'll walk you through on this call what things should be utilized in the transition manual, but making sure that as soon as the new team comes on board, they're given that so that they can, you know, their first event might be one month after they have their position and they should have a place already to store um, information, event prep, things like that. Like I said, this can be pretty much as extensive or as basic as your team is ready for. We will walk through all of the different types of things that should or can be included in a transition manual. Um, but the main point of importance here is just that these transition manuals need to be distributed early and people need to be held accountable for filling them out throughout the year. Um, depending on if you are a spring or a fall event, after the spring semester, after the summer, after the fall semester, checking in with your teams that they've already started filling out these manuals so that, you know, one week post event comes and they're due and they're not trying to do it all the night before. Um, that way things aren't forgotten. Again, we all think that we're going to remember what happened six months ago, but as many of you can probably recall in courses and things like that, it's a lot harder to cram for the final the night before than studying a few weeks in advance or checking in throughout the semester. So same concept here. <clears throat> um, another great resource that we'll dive into here in the next couple of slides is the position operating plan. This is basically a guideline for team members to sort of set their goals for the year, set their strategic priorities, and really think through like in depth what their position means and what they will be doing all year long. Um, that is a lot more for getting organized and for understanding their position than it is, you know, immediately post transition, but it will be something that can also serve as a great starting point to look back at last year's position operating plan and see maybe what areas of opportunity we have and things like that going forward. And then like we've said a few times before, just preparing your team members to really keep records of important conversations and contacts. They should sort of be logging anything um, that they do. I think that a good example is, you know, a corporate partnerships executive should be keeping all email correspondence, keeping all contacts, everything like that. Um, so yeah, position operating plans, they are a great guide to get your team members thinking strategically. So operational planning, as you can see here, is the process of planning strategic goals and objectives. Um, basically, and we'll show you guys some examples of these afterwards, but this document just serves as a starting point for people to come through and think about what do I need to do in my position? What would be a great wish list for my position? And how exactly am I going to get my goals accomplished? So um, it can walk team members through contingency plans if you know catering sponsors don't work out or corporate sponsors or national sponsors don't work out. 
Um, it can walk people through who on the team they're going to be interacting with frequently, who they need to reach out to outside of the team. All of things, all of these things, it will sort of be their guiding arrow for their strategic mindset for the rest of the year. Um, but the most vital part of this document is that it's living and breathing. It's not, you know, filled out at the beginning of the year and then never visited again. There should be space for edits and additions. If we realize that, you know, our starting goals were not realistic or we get halfway through the year, we don't think we're going to hit them, leaving a place uh, for that kind of information at the bottom or at the back of the sheet so that when people are looking back on it next year, they can understand why exactly, you know, goals were, were, were not met and why exactly plans did or didn't change. Um, so now we'll sort of walk you guys through that transition timeline that we were talking about earlier. Um, two to three months out from the event, lots of things are going on, but these are what we suggest you guys should be doing to prepare for transitions. Um, obviously deciding upon the organizational structure for the year. So are there positions on your board that could be taken away? Are there positions that are doing too much and need to be split into two roles? Um, an example of that is always like our recruitment teams on uh, at programs. We, if it falls too much on the shoulders of one person, how can we split that up to make it a little bit easier for, you know, Greek recruitment or first year participant recruitment or, you know, alumni and partner recruitment, things like that. Um, you guys also will want to sort of update those position descriptions. So again, as the year goes on, things may change, responsibilities may be broken up in ways that we didn't foresee at the beginning of the year. So making sure that we're updating those descriptions to be completely accurate to which team members um, are doing what. Um, we also recommend that you guys put together sort of a list of responsibilities that all executive board members will have to complete. So if there is a certain time commitment or if there's a fundraising commitment or <clears throat> any other responsibilities that executive board, executive board members um, are held to that they know those right off the bat and that those are included in the position description and the organizational structure. Um, you guys will also want to make sure that you are deciding on the application and interview timeline. So we really, really encourage you guys to actually pick the dates of these interviews and these application due dates and things like that so that when we get to after the event, it's already set in stone, the rooms are already reserved, we don't have to worry about <clears throat> planning around the application timeline. Um, we will go into interview logistics in a little bit, but like you can, you can also decide the structure of how you're going to interview. So who is going to be interviewing, um, who will be making the decisions on the applicants, and how will we roll out the decisions that are made. We also encourage you guys to get um, really into the weeds and really make a detailed promotional plan for your executive board position. So how are we gonna to talk to past participants? How are we gonna to talk to other levels of leadership? How are we gonna tell campus that these interviews and these applications are coming up? Um, honestly, we really suggest having some sort of interest form or QR code or a table at the actual event that you can say, our applications open the minute you leave tonight and they close in two weeks. Come talk to us at the back if you're interested about getting more involved next year. Um, we've seen programs use QR codes to send people to their website or to send them to their Google form application. And then you can really, I mean, you can send out emails to past participants. You can do any of that to promote. However, we also rec recommend that you hold interest meetings um, so that people who might be a little bit hesitant to take that next step and jump into leadership can come and actually talk to the people that served in those positions last year and get a better feel for this, um, what the role will be. We obviously think that if you have the opportunity presenting in front of key groups on campus, so is there an SGA or um, you know an IFC Panhellenic type structure that you guys can get in front of and really sell your organization and sell the experience that the leadership board gives, could give people so that they can get, um, and we get the most qualified campuses, uh, qualified people on campus to apply. And then there's always the classic social media promotion plan, making sure that you guys are spacing out posts and being strategic about when you're advertising these goals to people. 
Oh no. Okay. Well, Becca talked really high level about um, the key comp uh, the transition timeline and um, what that looks like. I wanted to get more into the meat and potatoes of this, um, but Poll Everywhere does not seem to be working at the moment. So in the Q&A and in the um, comments on YouTube, I would love to hear from you all, what kind of information do you think is the most important during a transition process? Um, thinking about all of the things that Becca and I have said so far, if you were to pick one specific thing, what sticks out in your mind is like, this is the one thing we have to t make sure we transition content wise um, from our outgoing team to our incoming team. So we'll give folks one second to answer that. And you can just use the, the Q&A or the chat feature. So clear roles and expectations for each positions, responsibility and job description, um, responsibilities. I'm seeing a lot of uh, contacts. Um, awesome, 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 awesome. So a little bit of everything, which is great. And I would say that you're all right. So this was kind of a trick question. Um, deadlines and timelines, absolutely. So that, like I said, this was kind of a trick question. Uh, we believe all of those things are super important to talk about uh, during an effective transition and what makes the transition great. So I'll go through each thing a little bit um, in more detail, just some key components of what make an effective transition manual or position operating plan, um, whatever you decide to call this document, but it should be a document that lives and breathes throughout the year uh, that folks on your team can add to. So. The first uh, being duties and responsibilities. So this would kind of be that in-depth position operating plan, job descriptions, um, things that overarch the entire year. You know, taking a look at what overall responsibility does this person have on the team? How do they fit in to uh, a sub team, like an internal committee or an external committee, finance maybe? Um, and what their role is responsible for on the team overall. The next thing, taking that one step further, would be assignments. So this uh, includes descriptions of current prog uh, projects that are in place, um, things that need to be top of mind during this transition process from the outgoing team to the incoming team, and also just any special projects that were owned by this position over the course of the year. Uh, and then finally, to wrap up this slide, uh, key contacts. So thinking internal or external relationships, whether it's with folks at CMN or the hospital or people at your university or your corporate partner contacts. Those are all incredibly important contacts to maintain and make sure that everyone knows who this incoming person is, why someone from your university is reaching out to them about Dance Marathon, um, it's always, always important to make those introductions and keep those contacts uh, present throughout this transition process. The introduction piece, I would argue, is the most important part of that transition for contacts specifically. Uh, if possible, setting up an in-person meeting to say, hey, here's Becca, she's going to be your new event operations person for Dance Marathon and we'll work with you next year on all things event operation and facilities for our event space. Um, In-person is great because then they can put a face to the name and then that way if Becca emails a facilities person, they'll be like, oh, I know her, she's great. Um, I'll respond to this quickly instead of magically having it disappeared in inbox somewhere. Some other things that are key components of an effective transition manual uh, would be not, uh, knowledge transfer. So there's a lot that might not live on paper um, that might not fall into a job responsibility or an assignment uh, project of some sort that is needed to share for a specific position. 
So making sure uh, throughout the year, you're creating a checklist of items to be discussed during the transition process that sort of fall outside the lines of a specific uh, job description. Key to this would be contact um, login information, social media login information, uh, anything with the interwebs is super important. If you have a um, storage facility off campus somewhere where you keep your event supplies or t-shirts, making sure that incoming folks know about that, the combination to any locks, all of that kind of in the weeds logistical stuff. Um, as Becca mentioned, using shared emails or Google Drive or Office 365, those are all great features, but we'll do nothing if people don't know the passwords to those and don't know how to access that information. Finally, um, I think to round off key components would be issues and roadblocks. There might be things that happened throughout the year that no one was expecting and how your team dealed with those instances. It's important that though they might not happen again, talk through those and talk what your strategy was to overcome them. You want the incoming team to feel like this dude right here. You want them to be like roadblock ahead. Yeah, I sure hope it works. Like, come on, let's get, let's get through this, you know? So those are all key effective, uh, key components to an effective transition manual uh, position uh, operating plan, whatever you call this document. But as I said, it should be living and breathing throughout the year. Your team members should be adding to it uh, and it should be holistic of any one person's position. Moving on now, back to that transition timeline. So Becca had talked about um, how to prepare for this transition process and share out this information before or at your event, but what happens after uh, these applications go live, right? So applications are released with the announcements of all of the dates that have been discussed. Um, you want folks to feel like this when they're filling out these applications. They know exactly what they're doing. They're just typing away, having a great time. Uh, additionally, info sessions are a great way to share out information about this. Um, and then sharing the application in, in post-event emails is also a great way to communicate out post-event application deadlines um, and materials. Further than that, so after application deadline is closed, you're gonna have interviews with folks. A lot of my programs, a lot of programs that I hear from don't always do interviews. Uh, I think it can depend on the position, but what I find is going through an interview process does a couple things for you. It makes the process feel a lot more legitimate. Um, it makes things, the decision uh, seem a little bit more fair overall. Uh, and it also gives you, as the person who might be selecting this new team, an opportunity to ask some more difficult questions that you might not be able to ask uh, in an interview. If it's someone you know um, and they were on the team last year, maybe they struggled with a few things here and there, I think it's fair to ask them about those instances and if they're applying for a higher position, how can they balance their time with Dance Marathon and their other responsibilities to make Dance Marathon a top priority. Um, things like that are great questions to ask in an interview. Uh, I also highly recommend as much as possible, including your university advisor, a hospital advisor, or um, CMN staff, so your Dance Marathon manager, um, into those conversations and interviews when appropriate to help get a variety of perspectives of uh, what those can look like. So moving on, this is now when you'll have your transition meeting. So after your team has been selected, you send out emails, everyone's super excited. It's important to have a transition meeting to start that tra transition process. Um, it is compromised of new team and outgoing team uh, and talking through all of those different components that I mentioned earlier of what makes an effective transition. The key thing with this transition meeting is that this should not be the last time these two positions are communicating with each other. It should be a constant conversation over the course of a couple days or maybe even a couple weeks to fully transition this person into this role. So once you've had your transition meeting and things have picked up steam with your new team, it's time for a retreat. Um, this can happen at the hospital, this can happen somewhere on campus and some sort of like leadership building opportunity your campus may have, or it can happen off campus and um, 
you know, I've heard stories of uh, like cottages and cabins and all those wonderful things. Um, if you have access to those things, that could be a great way to get folks together to really bond as a new team. Um, this step I think is incredibly important because you want this team to feel cohesive. Uh, parts of this retreat should encompass your um, dance marathon, absolutely, but parts of it should also just be getting to know each other. This is a new group of students coming together that may not have worked together before. It's important to take the time to get to know each other as people and to focus on dance marathon. So don't forget to do both. On the next slide here, we have a calendar of what this potentially could look like. So we're heading into the month of February and let's say that our event is happening on um, Saturday, February 8th. We are gonna release the applications first thing Monday morning and make all of the announcements about it. We'll have an interest meeting on Wednesday for anyone who uh, wants to be part of Dance Marathon but isn't quite sure about a specific position or has specific questions about time commitment and all of that. We want everyone to have an opportunity to address those as a whole. Later that week, or maybe even Monday, Tuesday of next week, we'll end the application process and begin selecting folks for the next round interview. Um, depending on how many people apply, maybe you interview everybody, maybe you interview a handful of people. Um, that truly is up to you. But I, again, I do think the interviews are super important. To this, we have a clear three day, this is when we're doing interviews, that is defined. That is super important because you wanna make sure, one, when people apply, they know sometime during those days, they should expect an interview, uh, but also for you all to book rooms in advance and have those spaces, spaces reserved on campus. Um, you wanna be able to have these interviews, not in your student union, not in a dining hall, preferably in a, in a closed door room where things can feel a little bit more private and you can ask some more um, serious questions. After the interviews have ended, then you can notify your applicants. I also think it's important to notify folks um, who receive positions, but then also folks that don't. Uh, we, I have found a good best practice in offering folks a position, giving them an opportunity to respond by a certain time and, and accept that offer, and then sending out the emails to other folks, letting them know they didn't get the position. Um, I don't think there's ever really been an issue with that, but that sort of just makes sense to me and, and is a good way to make sure that you have folks that want to be on that team and have accepted the position. Uh, uh, once the new team has been selected, we'll go through that first week and then have our transition meeting on Saturday. So obviously this is a very quick timeline and we, we want to capitalize on the excitement of our event. So that's why we're having applications right after our event date. And since we've talked about this before, we know what materials we need for our applications and we've managed to take care of all of the application materials during our winter break or earlier in January when things were a little bit slower before we got back to school. Uh, again, as Becca was saying, promotion can occur throughout this entire timeline. So Instagram stories, um, FAQs, info sessions, signage on campus, presentations to different organizations or student government, Greek life, different lecture halls, all of those different things can happen simultaneously during that application process post event. But just a sample of what a timeline would look like if you're like me and need a little bit more of a visual to see how this can all fit together. So we're gonna pass it back to Becca. She'll talk about some ongoing conversations. Absolutely. Um, so we've mentioned this a few times, but there are a lot of conversations that need to continue sort of seamlessly into the transition between the two teams. I think that you can tell by our use of bold letters and capitalization that a lot of these around finance are very, very, very important. Um, we all know that we collect a lot of cash, coins, Venmo donations, things like that during our events that are not being immediately transferred to the hospital. So the outgoing vice president of finance and the incoming finance uh, director really needs to be in constant communication about where the offline money went. Um, I've had a lot of programs where sometimes that money just gets stuck in the Venmo and we never even transfer it to a bank account. So 
making sure that all money transfers have been done, all offline donation deposits have been made, and then that we actually even take it that step farther and send that check to the hospital. Um, ideally, this uh, conversation was started on whatever tracking document you guys use and you have an exact number that needs to go to the hospital. And then when those deposits clear or those transfers clear, making sure that the new finance team gets that sent uh, to the hospital as soon as possible. It makes it really, really difficult for um, our hospitals to be hunting down this money if it's, you know, the summer or the next fall and they still haven't received it yet. Um, and it also gets some programs into a sticky situation where we're spending money that's actually uh, donation dollars instead of, you know, operational budget dollars, things like that. So making sure that all of those records are written down and transferred between teams. Um, equally as important, stewarding our partners. So whether you are a recipient of a national partnership or you have local partnerships that your team has gotten out there and secured, making sure that um, all of the final stewardship pieces are done. So if you've promised some people some posts a thank you post on social media or if you promise them wrap reports or any kind of last minute hospital tours or you know after the fact hospital tours things like that making sure that those promises are kept um corporate execs should be sort of keeping some sort of checklist to make sure that every partner is stewarded in the exact way that they were promised uh this will help with retention of sponsorship dollars incredibly um because fulfilling those commitments should be the first priority. Um, a lot of times also we get invoiced for our event space or invoiced for our catering and things like that. And it needs to be paid after the fact, um, t-shirts, anything like those large expenses. So making sure that we pass those invoices along to team members so that we don't start the next year in debt to the university because that is never a fun conversation to have with a student um, or an office. And then also making sure that our budget is in good order. So keeping some sort of document that, like I said, tells how much money in the bank account needs to go to the hospital, how much money in the Venmo needs to go to the hospital versus what we're starting out with operational costs. Um, again, all of these conversations should ideally include your university advisor or your hospital advisor as well so that they can be in the loop and they can be sure that they are looking out for when they should be receiving things. Um, other things that we wanted to put on everybody's radar is making sure that, um, you know, our people are taken care of as well. So are we stewarding uh, organizations that help us get to our goals? Are we stewarding campus partners or campus offices that help us get to our goals in the same way that a monetary partner would? Um, all of those contacts and those networks that your team built last year need to be um, shared and cultivated throughout the year and throughout the transition. Uh, it never hurts to send a thank you follow up to these teams and to these important stakeholders, but you can't do that if you don't know who they are. So making sure that, again, those networks are um, activated and shared. We also know that a lot of our programs will do post event surveys. So it may be the old team that sends it out or we may open it up at the event, but it then the onus falls on the new team to actually look at those results and plan the year based on the results given. So. If we ask our participants to take this survey, we ask them to give us 10 or 15 minutes of their time, we should also make sure that we're actually looking at the results and that we're trying to plan our year um, based on the feedback that we receive from our constituents. So making sure that, like Derek mentioned, logins are shared or results are shared or they're downloaded into a spreadsheet that somebody else can access because it doesn't do our graduating seniors any good if they're the only ones that can see that. Um, and we don't help the teams after us. Another important thing to consider for spring events is a lot of the dance winners on leadership conference deadlines and timelines fall around when you guys are transitioning. So if you guys uh, applied to present at all throughout the conference uh, before you transitioned, making sure that the other team has those applications and any correspondence that might have occurred between CMN and your program, but also thinking about how are we gonna get funding? So the conference does fall in the summer and a lot of the like SGA or student org fund deadlines are in the middle of the semester for summer funding. So making sure that the new team is equipped to apply for those funds, or if you already applied for them, making sure that they're equipped to go to the um, meetings that come with accepting them or work out funding on their own. Um, again, awards, BMLC awards, those applications come out and it's 
uh, obviously based on the year prior, but making sure that your teammates um, have, you know, suggestions maybe for which awards they should apply for or any notes that you have been taking throughout the year to help them create those applications for those awards and those presentations since they may not have been sitting through those experiences themselves. Um, so yeah, touching a little bit back onto the interview logistics, these are sort of three common questions that we get a lot from programs about how to conduct interviews in a professional, but also a highly personal way. We know that leading a dance marathon is so difficult because you're leading your peers. You're not given you know, authority over these folks. They are truly your classmates, sometimes your best friends, but also people that are just trying to unite with you for the common good. So the interpersonal aspect of applications and interviews can be difficult. And we wanna make sure that we can equip you guys to handle that uh, the best possible. So who should be interviewing the applicant? Usually um, that we, we suggest that you sort of do whatever works best for your program in a way that makes sense for efficiency and effective interviews. So what I usually recommend is that the outgoing presidential board, steering committee president, um, holds the interviews for the incoming president or um, steering committee with, with a university or hospital advisor present. That way, once that first round of those folks are selected, they can sit in on the people that are interviewing for the director so that they can sort of pick their team. Um, I have had a lot of issues in the past with programs with you know, vice presidents or presidents that maybe didn't get to pick their own team, and there are personalities that just do not mesh. They all are great individuals, but they cannot work together for the life of them because they just don't work well. They have different styles of getting things done, different communication styles, things like that. And that can be very, very frustrating for someone who's coming into these positions. They're ready to take on the world and they just can't work with their team. So giving next year's leaders the opportunity to have a say in who they want to select really gives the ownership to them of their team. And it makes sure that we avoid any of those situations where there's two or three people in a room that just cannot get along no matter how hard they try. We've all been there for that at some point in time. So trying to diminish the possibility of that. Um, also, it's very, very, very helpful to have a university or hospital advisor with you because we know that sometimes those difficult conversations are gonna come up. People might not be given the position they were selected for or not given a position at all. Um, and just as the nature of young adults, they might be upset or frustrated by that. And it's really, really hard to step into a leadership position and have to handle that right away. Um, we found that when advisors are in the room, there is a certain um, air of professionalism that is not the same as it's just all students, but also those advisors, especially university ones, are trained in you know, mitigating these situations and they can help take the burden off of you guys as leaders or the new leaders for next year. Um, basically, the answer to the second question is the same to the first. I think that it is really important to give the new leaders an opportunity to choose their team. Whether you guys have vice presidents or you're not quite at that tiered structure yet, at least giving the new president a chance to have a say in their team. Um, I also think that advisors should have a say. A lot of them have been around, you know, four or five years, so they have maybe see trends in interviews or they might, you know, have a cautionary tale of people that were picked in the past that they can help with, but also again, they, it is part of their training. They're really good at it. They can help guide those conversations and they can help your team think logically through who, who should be placed where. Um, Derek touched a little bit on the third question in his timeline, but it says, you know, how should we notify the applicants about our decision? Um, I agree wholeheartedly with what he said that we should call those that we're gonna offer positions to or email them and allow them to accept before we, um, let, notify people that didn't get positions. There are, There is a chance that if someone's placed at a position they didn't rank in their top three or placed in a position they didn't rank at all, they won't want it. And that is completely okay. That's something that we should give them the opportunity to say. And then after that, we can move along to somebody that maybe wasn't our first pick. But we can't do that if we tell everybody who didn't get a position first. So making sure that we make sure that everybody accepts and then we can tell those that we didn't get a position. Um, again, CCing or having a 
uh, advisor present on those conversations can sometimes mitigate the negative responses that some people will have to their placement or to their um, non-placement. Um, now we get to the exciting part. We will go through and give you guys some examples of these things in action. So I will let Derek jump in to application questions. Absolutely. My favorite part of transition to the application, um, which is weird, I know, but it's fun. So obviously you want to start with just some basic information. Contact and demographic information is always great to collect. Um, you'll see in this example, there's email, full name, phone number. Um, you might also want to consider how many years have you participated with Dance Marathon? Uh, what, what is your graduation year? What's your major? What other organizations are you part of? Uh, so you can get a little bit more of a representative from your entire school if you notice that, oh, hey, we have a bunch of seniors on the board. Um, not a lot of people are sticking around. That's a problem. Asking this kind of question up front is good just to keep in mind. And this isn't to knock anyone out because they're a senior or because they're a freshman, um, but just to give you all a better idea of who's applying and what their skill sets might be. Um, so that is the first part. If we move to the second portion, uh, this is where you can have applicants identify a desired position. So it's a little bit difficult to read um, just because the font is so small, but essentially it's asking what is your first choice position? And then the question after that is what is your second choice position? Um, you can do it this way. You can set up uh, your position ranking in a number of ways. Uh, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do this. Uh, I do encourage you uh, to have a separate application for each position uh, for at least your top positions. I don't think it's necessary uh, for some of your chair positions, but like your internal director, your external director, your president, your finance director, those are all positions that might warrant a separate application that ask more specific details about that specific skill set. Um, like I said, no right or wrong way to do that, but just something for you all to consider. Uh, and then asking for a resume or CV um, is always a great idea. It's just some good additional information to have. Moving now to some more of like the meat and potatoes of an application. Um, ask some questions that get to the root of why someone is applying. So some of the examples here are why are you interested in dance marathon? What service and philanthropy experience do you have? Why uh, did you choose the position you did? Um, also a another great question that um, could be asked in an interview too and I think I'll get to this but of all of the organizations on campus, why Dance Marathon? Um, and if there's a specific skill set needed for a position like finance or social media, creative director, if you're doing graphic design stuff, asking what experience they have in those worlds as well. Um, additional information like this is always great to know. And then I always recommend ending or throwing in a fun question. So. Um, if you had to be a character on a children's TV show, which would you be? Uh, something that is super lighthearted, doesn't really impact the application, but can give you some good insight into who's applying for a specific position. Next, we'll move from application to interview questions. So overall, um, these, this gives you an opportunity to ask more specific questions than what you might be able to ask on an application, as we mentioned. You can see some examples here. Um, you might also be able to ask some situational questions too. It uh, gets folks to think on their feet and you can see how people can react to different situations. If there was an instance of um, something happening that was unexpected within this last year, bring up that scenario and say, how would you have responded in this situation? Um, I recommend having it be a hypothetical situation that probably has happened or uh, likely happens every year. That way it's a little bit less pressure on that person to think of something creative um, or like the right answer, quote unquote. But, uh, you know, just, just gives you insight into uh, how that person thinks and how they handle solutions. Um, 
some other questions asking about time commitments is super important. Uh, I think throughout this entire webinar, Becca and I have mentioned again and again, making those time commitments and expectations super available to people and very transparent. And I think the interview is another great opportunity face to face to say, hey, we know it's a big time commitment. What does your schedule look like? Do you have the time to commit to dance marathon? Um, can you attend DMLC? Things like that that are good to know, both from a budgeting standpoint and also to really drive home the point that this is a commitment that uh, can take up a lot of time. Um, if you're not selected for a specific position, would you consider another position or being on a committee? I think that's always a fair question to ask because it gives you some insight into if people want to be part of Dance Marathon and are truly excited about the cause and are just happy to be part of it in any way, or if they're just dead set on one specific position and if they don't get it, then they're done with Dance Marathon. Um, that could be very telling of someone's relation to the program as a whole. And then again, I always recommend throwing in a fun question. If you could be a, a kitchen utensil or appliance, what would you be and why? I've heard blender a number of times. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's fun and it's really cool to see what creative answers uh, people can come up with and takes the pressure off of the situation. Dance marathon is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be uh, something that people are excited about. So as much business as we talk, I think it's important to go back to some fun every once in a while, even during uh, this transition application and interview process. Absolutely. And so now I'll show you a few pictures of the position operating plan um, suggested layout that I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. So here you can see is just a very general name, position, position description, and then position purpose. So these questions I find really, really get people thinking about what can be done and how they can innovate in their position this year. Um, the position description is generally just sort of like the words on paper that we put to tell people what, um, what they will be doing, what tasks they will be accomplishing. Whereas the position purpose is really when people can start looking a little bit deeper and say, yeah, why does this ex position exist? What are my audiences? What are my constituencies? Who do I have to um, cater to and appeal to in this position? So, um, you know, for example, recruitment would say this position exists because, you know, people are the heartbeat of Dance Marathon and we wouldn't be where we are without our people. So we need to make sure from the very first interaction to the very last interaction that they have with us, we're treating them um, in a proper way and we're stewarding them and we're giving them a great, great experience. Um, so it kind of gets people to think a little bit deeper about their position and why um, our organization really needs them. And then you can see it just asks, you know, who will I be working with on a regular basis? So if I know I'm going to work with event ops a lot, I can just buddy up to them right away and get to know them well. If I know I'm going to work with finance, et cetera, et cetera, or fundraising, I can start forming those relationships as well. Um, it also sort of gets you thinking about every interaction and what we would sort of call this consumer chain. You know, I develop the product maybe, which is the fundraising push day plans, but then I need to work with PR to push them out and to sell them to my groups. I need to work with uh, dancer relations to make sure the team captains know what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets people really thinking through every interaction that they will have and who they can bring into those interactions to make them the best they can be. Um, on the second part here, we can see some things like I was talking about earlier, what do I have to get accomplished? If I am catering, I have to make sure that we feed our participants twice. What could I do? I could make sure we feed them twice and get them cool snacks and get our vendor uh, food trucks to come onto campus. And maybe I could also get, you know, Coca-Cola to spot for us, things like that. But I know at the bare minimum, I have to secure two meals for our event. So get in to think through, you know, I sort of, think of this as like a priority checklist. So once I complete the things that I have to do, then I can move into my wish list items. And those wish list items could be as crazy or as out there as you want. Um, and then we actually give people a place to write out those goals in terms of priorities. So um, what are the sort of themes they're gonna hold to throughout the year and which should be the ones that are important. 
I love this section because as the year goes on and, you know, special events is trying to plan four different things or participant recruitment wants to do all these out there plans, we can bring them back to the position operating plan and we can say, okay, how does this particular spirit night or this particular campus event uh, feed into us accomplishing our most uh, important goals? How does this feed into priority one or priority two or priority three? And if teammates can't say that it will directly further those goals, then that's also an argument for us to not do it. So um, we're sort of setting up the parameters of these positions, but also holding people to what they think is the most important to get done. Um, and then the final section is sort of this open spot where people can think about how am I going to get to where I need to get um, in this position. So then we will go through some transition manual examples. Um, just very briefly, this is a checklist that appears at one of the front pages um, for one of our organizations. They sort of give their people a checklist of what they have to include in their transition binder. So we know that some people out there on our teams are gonna be very type A, they're gonna plan everything out, they're gonna include every single email they ever sent. But then we also know that some are gonna hand over two contacts and they'll log into the Instagram and they're not gonna have anything else to share. So making sure we put some parameters around what people have to include versus what they can include. This is very fun and nice because it's just a checklist so they can actually go in there and physically check off the things once they have them in the binder. Um, which keeps everybody organized and makes everybody's life a lot easier. Um, this is a really great, great, great uh, post-event report form or campaign report form developed by one of our programs. So this basically walks through all of the details from an on-campus event that they had or a fundraising event or recruitment week or whatever it is, and it gives them all of the positions or all of the places to write down who was involved, what was the purpose, what were any metrics or things, results that we saw um, after this event was held? What were the expenses? What are our recommendations? Everything. It's basically a brain dump for everything that goes into planning an on-campus event. Um, and so I think that every director that has to plan anything, whether it's a fundraising week or a recruitment week or a special event or whatever, should have to fill these out. Um, one best practice with these is to make sure that we're actually putting dates on when they're due. So it doesn't do me a whole lot of good if our fundraising push from the fall wasn't reported on or, you know, filled out until one week after our event, because it's likely that the person that planned it doesn't even remember all that went into it. So making these due and then checking up on them um, two to three weeks after the big events occur, I think is really great and make sure that we log all of that important information. Um, and finally, we just have some other sections that are helpful to have. So I don't think that you can really have a transition manual without some sort of timeline of the major responsibilities. So this can take you through year or month by month in the year of what uh, each position needs to accomplish. They can write down important dates. They can write down, you know, in April, they started planning for the summer fundraising push, et cetera, et cetera. Just making sure that all of those interactions and all of those dates are recorded. Um, there is a section if a director or chair, a set of chair team leads a committee, there is a place for you to put in all of that information about the committee. So again, we know that our committee members and our internal members raise a ton of money for us. And their experience is incredibly important, not only for fostering future leadership, which is fostering a good culture and a great organization on campus. So talking about, you know, how I led my committee, what did I run into? What barriers did I run into? What did I do to have my, to help my committee have a little fun? You know, maybe we went, we got pizza one night together or we had a, you know, Christmas gift exchange party at one of our houses, you know, whatever it is, just allowing those directors to give an example um, of how they led that committee. When, I was a student in participating in dance marathon. It was really helpful for me just to say, here's what I honestly struggled with. You know, here's how leading a committee was, you know, hard for me. And that maybe can help the next person do it a little better and improve that experience for our committee members just a little bit more. Um, and then I obviously love having a resources tab. So 
You can link out specific things in your shared information system. You can link webinars. You can link um, resources in the Miracle Network Answer Marathon Dropbox, all of that to make sure that people don't have to go hunting around for the things that will help them do their job better. Um, and then as always, a staple experience in one of my transition manuals is just a wish list. So maybe here are the things that I thought about halfway through the year that I didn't get to because I just didn't have the capacity, but here's what I think you should be working on from the very beginning. Um, that is, again, a good place for them to sort of put a guiding arrow for the next person just to say, hey, this would be great if in 10 years or 10 years, if in two years, we could have, you know, multi-year corporate partnerships. And here's how I think you can do it. Here's how I think you can pitch it. Just helping people make sure that um, they know where to start and they know where the past person sort of left off. Um, and all of these yeah. examples are in our Dropbox, so we will sort of talk through where you can find all of these things. Perfect segue into our tools and resources that we have for you. So as Becca mentioned, we have our Dance Marathon Resources Dropbox. There's a ton of information there, um, specific transition information, individual position resources, uh, this and other webinars. Uh, be sure to check it out and send it out to your teams. There's a wealth of knowledge in there that um, can help support all of you on this call. Um, additionally, Google Drive, Dropbox, Asana, or other task management tools. Um, these are all great places to house information and share information um, and make sure that things are getting done both throughout the year and also during this transition timeline. Um, your area dance marathon Facebook pages are a great way to connect with other dance marathons in your area, see what they're doing for transition um, and spark some great conversation there. And then of course your dance marathon manager. Um, Becca and I love this call, but all of our dance marathon managers are well equipped with this information and can help you with um, all of your transition needs and can set you up for some great transitions for your team. Uh, some of the sources that we have pulled from today, just one actually um, pulling some information from smartsheet.com about transition plan templates and where that information came from. So if you want to find out more about that, feel free to click that link. Um, otherwise, I'll pass it back over to Becca. Yeah, so thank you guys again for joining tonight. We hope that some of this knowledge and information was helpful to you as you guys start planning. We wanted to give you about three key takeaways that we thought came out of tonight. So one, that it's never too early to begin preparing for next year's transition. There is a lot of great habits that you can put in place from the very beginning of the year from you know, logging that information, to filling out event debrief forms, to commenting notes on the position operating plan that your members can be doing all year long to make sure that they have a bunch of information to give the next person. Um, second takeaway is that administrative details are important and they do make the difference in an effective transition. If things are not organized, if we don't have our timeline set out, it's gonna make our lives a lot harder. Um, administrative things like that transition manual, just having the correct resources to help our team. Um, and lastly, that thorough applications and interviews will only help your team in the long run. So this will make sure that you guys pick the right team. It'll make sure that you guys have people that are committed to the cause and committed to helping your organization grow year after year. Um, if we do put that little added extra air of professionalism and do make them go through an application and interview. That's it. Like I said, thank you so much for taking your time on your Tuesday evening uh, in a short week to spend it with us. If you need any more resources, please head to that Dropbox. Um, and if you can't find something that we presented on today or you can't find what you're looking for, please, please reach out to Derek or I or your individual Dance Marathon Manager. You can see our emails there and we would be happy to help you or talk through any of this in more depth if you're struggling with how to implement it for your own team. And that's it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, we hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, if you do have questions, as Becca said, feel free to reach out to your managers or Becca and I, and we can help you out. Otherwise, again, thanks for joining, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Have a great week.